Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the Film Brits Podcast. I'm your host Trilby, the Nathan Detroit of film criticism and thank you very much for joining me in the third episode of Film Brits. Uh, now, if you're watching the video version of this on my YouTube channel, I'm a very I'm very aware that I look tired. Uh, it has been a long week and I'm recording this quite late, so let's try and uh, stay awake through the whole thing. Uh, all joking aside, yeah, so let's just, move, let's just get straight into the podcast. We've got a lot to talk about today because we've also got a lot of questions as well. Thank you so much to the patrons on Patreon for submitting those questions, and I'll make sure to get to all of you towards the end of the podcast. There are time, uh, there are time stamps in the description below if you'd like to just skip to certain segments and skip stuff, but please do not skip this first segment, which will be the first segment of every podcast. It is Share the Love, where I talk about um, somebody who I think needs a bit of positivity or somebody who you need to uh, give some extra attention or some exposure or whatever. Now, I'm hardly the biggest YouTuber in the world ever, um, but sometimes it's just nice to give a shout out to people who I, whose content I really, really enjoy. And the internet is just full of so much negativity and so much pessimism and so much bile and hate that this segment is just to try and counteract all of that. So um, I would like to share the love to a YouTuber who's been around for many years called called M-I-T Sophia, um, that's E-M-M-I-G-H-T-Y Sophia, S-O-F-I-A, and basically she has, um, she's a, a very, very entertaining TV critic, um, she also, uh, she does a lot of, um, she does um, regular content talking about and reacting to TV shows that are very much uh, the big TV shows at the moment. She um, um, she kind of um, got some fame for talking about Dexter and getting very, very, very emotional about it in her video and getting so invested in the drama and just so passionate about the program that it's hard not to admire her. Um, she talks about shows like Game of Thrones, The Walking Dead, Breaking Bad, uh, Penny Dreadful, basically these cult genre shows that if, if um, you enjoy my content then I'm sure you will enjoy the content of these TV shows and my and, and mighty Sophia talking about them she has over 10,000 subscribers uh, she can find you can find her on YouTube you can find her on Twitter uh, you can find her on Facebook and also check out some of her song covers she is a surprisingly great singer as well so be sure to check those out those are that that is a mighty sophia on youtube so be sure to check her out i'll put some links in the description below if you are so inclined so that is my share the love segment and let's um yeah let's get to something a little bit more negative because the main topic of this week i was thinking about talking about it a few days ago when there was news that um, paramount pictures were expecting to lose upwards of 125 million dollars on the upcoming monster trucks movie now monster trucks is um it's a um how do you even describe it if you've seen the trailer um, it's basically a movie where this the, this teenager or this young adult played by Lucas Till, um, he gets a car and it, what happens is that a monster or some weird tentacled octopus thing from space comes along and what it does is that it befriends this kid and then it goes into the car and it starts controlling the car so that it's able to do outrageous stunts. It's really powerful. It's more, it's faster than ever. So that it's monster trucks. It is literally a monster inside of a pickup truck and they do what they go in these wacky adventures and stuff now i'm not gonna lie and say that the trailer looked like it, it, it the trailer did not do monster truck many favors but you know what i thought it would it looked like a fun time i thought it looked like a fun piece of kids entertainment uh, it's from the director it's from um chris wedge who uh, did ice age who did epic and who did robots now he's a he's a decent uh, animated film director but i think this is actually his uh, his directorial debut um, he he is very much an animated director, and this was his first stint into into live action. And it seems to have gone the same way as John Carter, where we had Andrew Stanton, who had basically only done animated films, and then he does this big film, and then it's just set to bomb. I, like John Carter was a massive bomb for Disney and lost them like a hundred million dollars. But Monster Trucks, it's <laughs> it, it's a film where it probably didn't need the one hundred and twenty five million budget that it actually has. And before you even put into into account the market marketing and the distribution and all of the other ancillary costs that surround a movie release this movie was almost set to immediately fail and what's happened is that news has come out saying that Paramount Pictures are expecting to lose upwards of 125 million dollars they are bracing themselves massively for a loss and I was thinking when this story um, when this story broke I was thinking maybe talking about the year that Paramount Pictures had because Paramount Pictures we talked about this in the um, in previous episodes they have not had a great year and I was thinking of maybe dedicating the segment to talking about the year of Paramount Pictures 
And then Variety broke a story. They broke the story that Rob Moore, who was the vice chairman of Paramount Pictures, has uh, is going to be leaving. He's going to be stepping down from his post, and Paramount do not expect to fill Moore's position anytime soon. So Paramount Pictures will be without a chairman. And then these other stories came out about talking about how Paramount Pictures were expecting to lose. Uh, this year, they were telling investors that they were prepared to lose half a billion dollars, $500 million they were expected to lose in 2016 because their movies have just not been performing. And you, the writing was kind of on the wall uh, a few months ago for Paramount Pictures because it's kind of depressing because, you know what, they have had some decent films. Now, you've got, like, I'm going to go through, uh, the, this is the Wikipedia list of all the films that they've had coming out, uh, they've had coming out in 2016, and first we had 13 Hours, The Secret Soldiers of Benghazi by Michael Bay, and this is one of the um, projects that Michael Bay is allowed to do between Transformers films in order to keep him happy, because Michael Bay, he likes to think of himself as an auteur or an artist, uh, which is interesting. It's an interesting approach. Um, so he does a Transformers film. He makes Paramount a billion dollars. And then Paramount say, okay, you can do a smaller passion project film as long as you come back and do Transformers the next year. And between Transformers Age of Extinction and Transformers The Last Night, he made 13 Hours The Secret Soldiers of Benghazi. Now, the film wasn't... It didn't cost a huge amount. It maybe had a $40, 50000000 million budget. And it made back its production budget. But when it comes to marketing and distribution, it just didn't, it just didn't happen. Paramount lost money on 13 hours but they're going to make that money back on transforms anyway so it's not a big deal zoolander 2 uh, was actually one of the most anticipated films of the year for many people it was a it was a it was a cult classic film a 50 million dollar budget a massive marketing campaign this marketing was everywhere and product placements and all it, was, it had a very big media presence but it only just made back its production budget it was another bomb for paramount pictures and then we have Wh whiskey tango foxtrot which was never going to be a big film a tina fey film uh, with Martin Freeman and Margot Robbie, big stars, but a small film, a small like 10, 15 million dollar project, which was never going to make back its budget. It's one of those films that kind of it keeps the stars happy, it keeps the gears turning at Paramount. It maybe could make its money back on DVD or through on demand streaming and Netflix and everything in the long run, but it was a smaller film. It's not a massive loss, like Paramount may lose maybe 10 to 15 million dollars on Whiskey Tango Fox. So I say not a lot, 15 million dollars, that's probably more money than I will see in my entire life but it's one of those films now 10 Cloverfield Lane is probably the biggest success that Paramount Pictures have had in 2016 so far and the reason for that is because they went this absolutely the right way 15 million dollar budget it made it broke over 100 million worldwide this was a very profitable film and it was profitable in the way that they didn't spend a lot on it it was a high return on investment and they marketed it right so they didn't um have a massive mystery box that was literally years in the making, which is one reason Star Trek Into Darkness just failed to resonate with audiences, because they had this mystery uh, that was set up two years in advance with the marketing and all the promotional tours, so people were saying, oh, Izzy Khan, Izzy Khan, is this going to happen in the movie, is this going to happen... And you had that for two years, so all the momentum just kept, because it just ran out and dried up. And by the time that Into Darkness came out, it just, critically, it was just a massive flop. And But with 10 Cloverfield Lane, when you only have maybe two or three months of promotional material to, to use or to work with and for the audiences to stew over, you don't get expectations quite as high, but you still have that level of intrigue. And they did a great job with 10 Cloverfield Lane. That was a undisputed hit for Paramount. And you know what? It was a massive improvement on Cloverfield. It's probably, if you were to count 10 Cloverfield Lane as a actual sequel, it might be the biggest jump up in quality that I've ever seen in terms of sequel. Because Cloverfield is bad. Like, really, really bad. And then 10 Cloverfield Lane is actually a great thriller. It's a great character piece. It, it's more of an actor's showpiece than an, act, than an actual story. But the actors are terrific. And people are even saying that maybe John Goodman should be nominated for an Oscar for 10 Cloverfield Lane. I don't think he will. But we've got to find a way to give that guy an Oscar at some point. So... Yeah, 10 Cloverfield Lane, let's do it. Now, Everybody Wants Some. This is the Richard Linklater film um, that was also... Um, it was kind of in the vein of Whiskey Tango Foxtrot, where, yeah, it's only co going to cost 10 $15 million. This made uh, bu a budget of $10 million. This made just under $5 million. So, yeah, this was another loss of Paramount Pictures, but it's not a massive loss. It's more of a prestige picture for Richard Linklater. Um, and we also have um, these more independent films that are going to make up the 
uh, the slack in digital distribution and on Netflix and on demand and streaming and DVD uh, out of the shadows approaching the unknown, uh, the intervention and um, and goat, which um, is apparently they're, they're getting some pretty good reviews across the board. Like some of them are more middling, but apparently goat is a really good film. But these are films that um, are going to be touring in festivals. They're meant to be scouting out for new talent and some new actors just to basically keep the wheels turning. But the bigger films are really where Paramount Pictures uh, kind of just got absolutely kneecapped. Uh, we had um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Out of the Shadows. Um, did I say Out of the Shadows was an indie film? On Wikipedia, it just says Out of the Shadows, so I just got confused, and like I said, I am tired. So it's Approaching the Unknown, The Intervention, and Ghost that are some of the more indie films. Out of the Shadows is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Out of the Shadows, What Am I On? So yeah, that film, it, it's, it's disheartening, because while I'm not going to say that Out of the Shadows is a great film, uh, it's, it's a good live-action cartoon, it is another massive improvement on its predecessor. Uh, the uh, the 2014 Platinum Dune Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is a pants film. It's really pants. It's really bad. It's just poorly thought out. And then this sequel comes out, which improves on it. It's like tw it's like twice as good as the as the um, previous film. The effects are strong. The action's good. It's a live action cartoon. It knows what it wants to be. It's honest with itself with itself and I'm sure that the younger audiences will get a massive kick out of it. It cost a hundred and thirty five million dollars, that's around a three hundred million breaking even point, but it made two hundred and forty five million dollars. This is another film that lost Paramount money, maybe uh, fifty to sixty million dollars. And um, also we have uh, Star Trek Beyond, which is another really depressing thing because they did it again. They made a sequel that was better than the original. Star Trek Beyond is the best movie in the reboot to Star Trek Star Trek trilogy. It is it's not even close. It is you get a mediocre first film, a pants second film, and then you get Star Trek Beyond, which is great. It hits it out of the park. It is a fun blockbuster, a great time, great cast, great effects, great action. The climax is brilliant to watch on the big screen. It feels heartfelt, and it's also dealing with a lot of themes, like particularly when um, during the production and pre-production of this film, it lost two of its... Uh, two of its stars, it lost Leonard Nimoy, it lost Anton Yelchin, and they actually made a big aspect of the plot about the passing of Leonard Nimoy and the passing of future Spock in these films, and while Anton Yelchin, um, he passed away when the film was in post-production, so it's not affected his part at all, there's a great moment at the end of the film when, then, when I think it's Kirk who's giving a speech, and then he talks about um, like the value of friends and having great companions, and then he just cuts to Anton Yelchin for just a couple of seconds, and then the scene carries on. That had to have been deliberate. It was a really nice moment. And Antoine Yelchin's a great talent as well. And it's a great film. It's a really fun time in a very moribund summer. And Star Trek Beyond just it injects so much fun. And as much as I love cinematic universes, as much as I love sequels and re and some and certain reboots and certain remakes. Star Trek Beyond was a standalone story. It wasn't leading into something. It wasn't piggybacking off Star Trek Beyond, uh, Star Trek Into Darkness, sorry, which um, <clears throat> Simon Pegg actually admitted he could not do because Star Trek Into Darkness wrote the franchise into a corner. So Star Trek Beyond basically had to ignore Star Trek Into Darkness, which is wonderfully vindicating. But the movie, while it, it's not a bomb... It may it cost one hundred eighty five million dollars to make. It's the most expensive Star Trek movie. It's made um, to date three hundred and thirty three million dollars. Uh, Star Trek um, Beyond, in order to really break even, has to be around the three fifty four hundred mark, and it still has an. Um, I think it has another couple of territories to open in. I'm not sure if it's opened in China yet, but if it has opened in China, there's probably still some more money yet to come from that. Paramount Pictures will probably be making <clears throat> a small profit on Star Trek Beyond, but not nearly enough to justify the uh, the cost of making it in the first place, which is depressing. So the franchise may continue, but it will be with a much lower budget in future. Um, and uh, don't be surprised if they, um, when they say we're going to go where no man has gone before, they're not going into space, they're going to go to China. Uh, so Florence Foster Jenkins was another prestige movie. Uh, it's probably going to be one of those films that um, it did well in the UK. Um, its budget was uh, 19 million and it's made 43 million. This is a profitable small um, 
a mid-tiered movie, which is um, always great to see. And it's going to be one of those films that will be talked about come awards season, mainly for the fact that Meryl Streep will have another Golden Globe nomination and possibly even a win in the Best Comedy or Musical category, and maybe even Hugh Grant as well. This is a Golden Globes-type movie. And now we come to Ben-Hur. And by the way, um, when it comes to Ben-Hur and all of the other films I've noticed, uh, I've, um, I've talked about, these are all of the films that Paramount Pictures has released in 2016 so far. And the only one that has been an indisputable hit was 10 Cloverfield Lane and Florence Foster Jenkins, but only by a modest degree. Now, Ben-Hur, it's in... This is one reason why John Moore, uh, the uh, former vice president, uh, the vice chairman of Paramount Pictures, is kind of taking a lot of flack and he's stepping down because he is a he is a very notable Christian in Christian in Hollywood. He is a devout um, devoutly religious man, and he is um, he wanted to make, remake Ben Hur and aim it at a uh, religious market and this is a hundred million dollar film hundred million dollars for marketing and ben hur is one of is the biggest flop of the summer we don't know if it's going to be the biggest flop of, of 2016 in general but in terms of the summer movie period it is the biggest flop <laughs> and it, it cost 100 million to make it has made 82 million so far there's a little bit more money still to come in but the momentum on ben hur has completely ran out it was hardly even there to begin with so Paramount are bracing themselves for a $100 million loss on Ben-Hur, and that's on top of all of the other losses that we've had so far. Now, let's look at the stuff that they've got coming up in the future, because it's not all doom and gloom. Jack Reach and Never Go Back opens next month. Uh, that's probably going to make a small amount of money. It's not going to do massive business, but it will make money. Um, Arrival, which is the uh, science fiction movie with J uh, Jeremy Renner and Amy Adams, that, I'm not sure what the budget on that is. Uh, that budget, um, 50 million budget, that's probably going to make a profit. The reviews have been great so far. I've heard a lot of best movie of 2016 um, headlines. I've heard a lot of that. Um, <clears throat> my voice. I've heard a lot of that recently. So <clears throat> we'll see if that goes <clears throat> if that goes well. So Allied is probably going to make Paramount Pictures some money. We've also got Office Christmas Party, which if you'd asked me a year ago about this movie being good uh, or, or being a success, I'm I would have said yes. However. When the night before bombed um, last year, which is a shame because the night before was a great film, um, I think that that sets a bad precedent for Office Christmas Party. This could actually be another bomb, uh, unfortunately, because it looks funny. Um, I think uh, it's got some very talented people in it, and it has some good potential. But after the night before bombed last um, last Christmas, um, I'm not going to be holding my breath for this to be a big box office hit. And we also have Fences, which is Paramount's big. Um, awards movie for this year's the Denzel Washington movie uh, based on the play of the same name where we yeah Denzel Washington Viola Davis and the plot is it's set in the 1950s and we have uh, a former Negro League baseball player now working as a waste collector who struggles to provide for his family and comes to terms with the events of his life that is uh, that is Oscar bait written all over it and it's actually directed by Denzel Washington I don't know if it's his, if it's his directorial debut I'm not sure I don't know much about Denzel Washington unfortunately in terms of outside of his his acting so but that is going to be um, their big prestige move for the year and then when we come to the beginning of um, 2017 uh, it's not looking great. Uh, we've got Monster Trucks, which, we, which we've talked about before, coming out in January. And coming out a week later, we've got Triple X Return of Xander Cage, which I'm predicting will also be a bomb in the vein of The Last Witch Hunter for Vin Diesel. Because the guy out, outside of Fast and Furious, he's just not bringing in money anymore. And also, no one's asking for this. No one's asking for a Triple X movie. Uh, we've got Rings, uh, which the marketing's been put really poor so far, and Ghost in the Shell, which could be big. Um, but when it comes to the summer, Paramount Pictures next year are going to be just fine. They've got Baywatch, which if the trailers are strong, it will probably make a lot of money. We've got World War Z2, which um, probably is going to be delayed because I don't even think they have a director for that, so that's probably not going to be happening. Transformers The Last Night will probably make them a lot of money, but um, that that is going to be their big money maker for next uh, for next year because the Transformers films make Paramount Pictures an awful lot of money which is why um, Paramount Pictures are going to be okay this is not me saying that Paramount is going to be all doom and gloom that they're going to be shutting down their doors next year that they're going to that uh, that the company is on fire literally um, that's not going to be happening because they've got um, um, they have got 
um, Transformers to rely on. They've got Michael Bay, and even if Michael Bay steps down, they will probably get another director to take his place. But what's interesting is that if you look in the top 10 highest grossing Paramount Pictures films um, of all time worldwide, number one, Titanic. Number two, Transformers 3. Number three, Transformers 4. Number four, Transformers 2. Number five, Shrek the Third. Number six, Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Number seven, Shrek Forever After. Number eight, Madagascar 3, Europe's Most Wanted. And number nine, Transformers. They don't make good successful films. Uh, Titanic has its moments, but I can't call it a good film. And then you've got Transformers, Transformers, and Transformers. Shrek the Third, which is abysmal. Indiana Jones. Uh, Shrek Forever After. I, I, no, I, actually, Madagascar 3 is alright. Madagascar 3 is alright. And then when you get to number 10 is when you have their first genuinely great film. Uh, Mission, Impos Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol, followed by Mission Impossible Rogue Nation. Then Forrest Gump, Interstellar, Kung Fu Panda 2, Kung Fu Panda. Um, so they don't have much in the way of franchises in terms of other properties. They've got Mission Impossible, which will do well for them. And they've got that, it's, I think it's going to be coming out in 2018, uh, the next Mission Impossible film. They're sorting out Tom Cruise's contract. I actually think that has been sorted this week. I think that was a new story. But um, yeah, Paramount Pictures might not be a massive dominant force in Hollywood outside of the Transformers movies, but I think they're going to be just fine over the next couple of years. So that was basically all I wanted to talk about. It's it's kind of depressing that Paramount Pictures this year, when they have Transformers to fall back on for billion dollar films, and when they do have um, you know the Shrek franchise, which they're hoping to bring back. When with these financial prospects, it makes a lot of sense why they want to bring it back. But Shrek three and four are not very good films. That when we have a year where they have done very well in terms of the actual quality of the films, I like Whiskey Tango Foxtrot a lot. They just they released Anomalisa, which was um which was nominated for Best Animated Film, which is a it's a terrific film. Um, Ten Cloverfield Lane, um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles: Out of the Shadows, and Star Trek Beyond are massive improvements on mediocre to poor previous installments. And I think the fact that they were able to improve on those films and those franchises and do and make very good films, uh, well, very good, Out of the Shadows is pretty good, it's, it's okay. But for Ten Cloverfield Lane and Star Trek Beyond, they made two legitimately great films and they've just, the rest of the year has just not been there to support them. They've just not done very well and Ben-Hur and Monster Trucks have just been massive flops, which is just a $500 million loss for Paramount. That's a lot of money. I don't care how uh, how big in Hollywood you are. I don't care how big a studio is. Five hundred million dollars is a lot of is a lot of money. That is two to three production budgets for massive tempo blockbusters. That is three films you could pay for, or you could make a hundred uh, five million dollar films, which would be absolutely lovely. But Paramount Pictures are not going to do that. So it's depressing. Um, I hope that uh, John Moore, who he's uh, John, not John Moore, Rob Moore. I hope that Rob Moore is able to sort of land on his feet here because despite the fact that this has been a very poor year for the studio, he has actually been at the forefront of the, the revival of the Mission Impossible franchise, the prominence of the, tra of the Transformers franchise. And also, let's not forget that Rob Moore is basically the reason that um, Paramount Pictures has got such a good relationship with China now. He is the one who instigated that. He uh, he extended the metaphorical uh, metaphorical olive branch, so to speak. He is the reason Transformers Age of Extinction was able to make a billion dollars because he had such a great relationship with his Chinese co-workers and his Chinese subsidiaries. So I think Rob Moore is a very good businessman. He just made some pretty poor decisions in terms of like monster trucks and um, and also Ben and Ben Hur and Triple X with the return of Xander Cage, which no one is asking for, which I'm pretty sure is going to bomb. But yeah, so. I hope that um, he lands on his feet. Paramount is going to be just fine, but it is disheartening to see a studio do some very good work and just kind of falls apart. So, yeah, let's let's see how he goes. See how we, let's see how you go, Rob. Hope you're doing well. But yeah, let's get on to some more positive things because I'm actually recording this on um, September 25th. Um, it's like the very early hours of the morning. And a couple of hours ago, it was September 24th, and September 24th was the 13th birthday 
of my Blu-ray of the week or my DVD of the week. I do own it on DVD, I just could not find it in my cupboard. But my Blu-ray DVD of the week or whatever is the Richard Linklater film School of Rock. Now what I was going to do is that I was thinking what came out on DVD and Blu-ray this week? Oh, Richard Linklater's Everybody Wants Some, which we talked about earlier in terms of Paramount Slate. And I was thinking, okay, I've not seen this yet. I've heard the reviews. It sounds like something I would hate. So let's focus on something a bit different. Let's focus on something that I would enjoy from Richard Linklater. And I'm going to go for what I think is his best movie, School of Rock. Yes, I said it. He was nominated for an Oscar for Boyhood. I don't care. I don't care about the Beyond trilogy or the Sunset trilogy, whatever. School of Rock. School of Rock is Richard Linklater's best film, and I have no qualms of saying I have no regrets. No regrets. School of Rock is, the, is a terrific film. And it was um, actually the highest grossing musical comedy of all time before Pitch Perfect 2 came around. So it was actually a big financial hit. It, it, it made Jack Black a feature film star, which um, which carries on to this day. He's in the Jumanji sequel slash remake slash reboot or whatever it is they're doing, which comes out um, next year with uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, Kevin Hart and Karen Gillan. Um, and it is, it is School of Rock that kind of cemented him as this um, as, a, as a force in Hollywood. And... The film's great. I, there's there's not much more to say about it. Basically, for those of you who don't know, School of Rock is um, it was released in 2003 by Paramount Pictures. I guess found that. Um, yeah, that was a success for them. They've done good stuff. Um, and it's um, Jack Black plays this guy who's um, he's just been kicked out of his rock band. Uh, he's a schlub. He's crashing on his friend's couch, um, and he's got a very annoying wife played by Sarah Silverman, and um, he. His his friend who he's crashing on the couch with is a substitute teacher. And what happens is that he needs money, he needs to be able to get his own place, he needs to be able to pay rent. So when they he answers the phone and they're like, oh, we need this guy, we need the substitute teacher, he pretends to be his friend and he goes into school because it's an easy paycheck. He basically just lounges around, he's lazy, to, he doesn't talk to the kids, he doesn't teach them anything, and he tries to get away with the absolute bare minimum, and what happens is that he's walking down the corridor one day, and he sees that they are all in a school band. They play piano, and cello, and violin, and, and it is basically a school orchestra, and he thinks, okay, what I could do is that there's a battle of the bands coming up with a cash prize. I can use these kids, I can teach them the ways of rock, I can teach them the ways of metal, and I can form a school of rock, I can form a band, I can teach them the ways of rock. And that's exactly what he does, and he teaches the... And it's actually a really endearing story, and the the film is fully aware that he is exploiting these kids and he it does um it does actually become quite poignant later on in the film and he actually develops a great relationship with these kids there's one girl who um he he asks for backup singers and these girls volunteer and then at the end um, of one rehearsal this other girl approaches him and says i'd like to be a singer and it turns out that she's absolutely amazing she was just embarrassed and she was very nervous and he makes her feel more secure about her talent and herself because she she's a big girl and and he's like i'm fat but i'm i'm awesome i'm awesome and i am fat uh, which i think is really earnest and it's just a really great moment and it's not preachy it's not overly sentimental it's just the right amount of schmaltz in there gets interspersed with some great comedy a great performance by jack black there's just some great visual humor like when he's he's um, looking at the school orchestra through the window uh, through the the window on this door and his eyebrows are doing waves as he's just thinking and contemplating I can't do anything with my eyebrows. I can't raise one over the other. I can't, if you're watching this on the YouTube video, you're probably just laughing and rubbing it in my face right now, but I can't raise one over the other. I, it's annoying. Uh, I'm not, I do not have a very versatile face. Uh, you probably figured this out already. Um, but he's a great, he's a great comic talent. There's some, um, Joan Cusack, I for, yes, she's in, um, I forgot who played her, um, but she plays the principal who gets drunk one scene and it turns out that she's a badass rock queen. Um, yeah, it's just a really funny film, really endearing. The kids are great as well, some great um, um, child, um, child performances. And this is the 13th birthday of School of Rock. And what happened is that, I don't know if it was this year, but Collider um, on their Facebook page shared a video of the group. I think it might have been a 10-year uh, reunion in 2013 of all of the kids from the band 
um, and the Jack Black coming together to perform at the, I believe it was the uh, Toronto International Film Festival. It was it was a film festival, and they all got together on the 10th anniversary of School of Rock, or a anniversary, and just performed. And they performed um, some of the songs from the movie, and the original backup singers were still there. Was backup singers? The bassist was there, um, and um, <laughs> probably the funniest line in the film. The bassist um, plays a cello, and he, and Jet Black's trying to explain how it's basically the same thing. Like, um, okay, you get this cello, and then cello, you got a bass. Um, <laughs> it probably sounds terrible coming from me, but um, yeah, School of Rock, a great film, and it still resonates with many people. Many people still enjoy it, and I think it's interesting that Richard Linklater would go on to make Boyhood, where, where he, he filmed a, a kid over the course of... How many years was it? Like, for a million years. He filmed this kid for years and years and years and capturing this really trite and really sen- and overly sentimental and cliche story about growing up. And it, was, it wasn't a good film. And I think it's interesting that that film had so much prestige and it was so hyped and it was meant to be a massive Oscar contender and it was meant to be really profound and moving... But School of Rock actually says a lot more about growing up and maturity and emotional maturity and what and and um, childhood and childhood. It says so much more about those issues and those topics in School of Rock than it does in the actual Boyhood movie, and I think that's absolutely fascinating. And I love School of Rock, so check out School of Rock on its birthday um, every every September October time. Check it out, and if you've not watched it, then I've hopefully introduced you to a really great film because school of rock that's legit so yeah school of rock is my dvd slash blu-ray of the week now let's get to the segment which i really really enjoy the most and that's going to be taking patreon questions and then we'll go to the twitter slash facebook lightning round now let me just take a sip right then so we've got three questions from the patrons uh, this week i did a call out asking people like your patrons you are you are able to submit proper topics and they weren't. We only had Dean Jones, but we actually got um, Winter and Zachary Taylor as well. So I'll start with Winter. Um, Winter commenting on the Paramount stuff. Uh, their slate was mostly sci-fi and comedy, but was not re- but was not really here this year. Uh, they had some good films like Ten Cloverfield Lane, Agreed, and Star Trek Beyond, Agreed. I'm really looking forward to Arrival, though. Uh, they made a serious mistake in Ben Hur. I'm not sure whether it was the marketing or if it just wasn't the time for a Ben Hur remake. My question is, what must a remake do or have to be a success in your opinion? Um, I'm not inherently against reboots. Like when I supported the, when I said that I liked the Ghostbusters film, people were like, "You're to blame if there's a Back to the Future remake." I wouldn't have an issue if there was a Back to the Future remake. I think if they, in concept, in principle. I don't have an issue with remakes. Like they're doing a Scarface film. They're doing a Jumanji sequel. Um, I don't have an issue with like the, the, this um, nostalgia grabbing up to a point. I think as long as the film can justify its own existence, as long as, as you have got a good creative team who respect the or respect and understand the original, then there's no problem here. Uh, you can make a good movie, movie out of almost anything, and that includes other movies. But what must a remake do or have to be a success, in your opinion? Um, it has to be relevant. It has to, when you have a topic, um, I'm just thinking, uh, like Back to the Future, I'm not against Back to the Future being remade on principle. I just don't think there's much there. I don't think that um, there's nothing in 2016 that you could talk about that um, that is different or adding some new layers that the original Back to the Future did not already do. I think the most you'd get out of a remake of Back to the Future is if um, they went back to um, 19... Like, if they did go back to the 1980s and it, the, the period that Marty McFly or whoever they whoever was the main character went back in time was the original setting which was the present in Back to the Future, I think that would really be the only um, interesting thing on a conceptual level, you could change the plot and the characters and stuff, but then if you're going too far away, then you don't really have Back to the Future anymore. It has to be relevant. The themes still have to resonate. The themes still have to be topical and timely. And you get a lot of films where, you, where if you were to watch, say, Robocop, and then you have a remake of Robocop, which could really work, which it, I think it did work in many ways, how it does still feel relevant when you do have these militarized uh, police services and all of these cri- this crime on the street. Uh, Robocop, while it has it has aged very very well, 
it is still relevant today, which sort of makes it prime for a reboot, with a, a reboot or a remake. And The Magnificent Seven, which I've not yet seen, um, that's another film where it kind of maybe benefits from the updated technology. Like, uh, The Magnificent Seven is, like, an action-heavy film, and maybe it could benefit with modern stunt work. It could benefit from modern special effects and modern makeup and modern costuming and production values. It's, it's if, if you want to make a big spectacle film, then Magnificent Seven, a remake of that with the new technology and, of course, new stars and new actors, because they are the main uh, draw. Uh, the talent is the main draw for a movie like Magnificent Seven, as, as well as the name. That is something that justifies being remade and rebooted. Uh, Ghostbusters, I think, had the iconography to be remade. It's got the Ghostbusters logo, it's got the Proton Pack and the Ecto-1. That stuff that does carry over. And, uh, if, if you were, and if you were to change it, then changing the genders of the cast is a great place as any to start. Because those themes of starting up a business, they do resonate with women as well. That is another angle to the story that is relevant and is also in keeping with the themes and the ideas of Ghostbusters. That makes sense. I was thinking of what other remakes there have been. Like, if you were to remake, um, like, a biopic, like, the, you, you don't really tend to see remakes of biopics. Like, I, I'm just thinking, like... Do we need another Elephant Man? Because that was basically done perfectly the first time. Do we need another Ray? Do we need an, another Muhammad Ali movie? Do we need... Uh, yeah, you don't really see remakes of biopics. And if you do, they're very much in close proximity with each other. So, that's... Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen a biopic be remade. Unless it was like... Um, it was really, really drastically different. Or really, really went against the true story. So, yeah, a remake would have to be relevant, it would have to um, be conceptually interesting as opposed to just, let's just remake this because it's a name, uh, which is not uh, the worst place ever to start, but you, you are fighting an uphill battle there. As for Ben-Hur, much like Magnificent Seven, that is something that could benefit from the spectacle, but when you get spectacle like Ben-Hur, it's just going to be updated special effects and updated CGI and stuff like that, whereas the original Ben-Hur was a massive spectacle film because everything was was practical, and there were a couple of like green screen or yellow screen shots or whatever it was back then, and you have these real-life horses, and you have this chariot race, and these massive sets, and these like, hundreds and hundreds of extras for this big spectacle. Ben-Hur... Um, the original uh, Charlton Heston film is already a remake. Uh, it was based off a silent film in the 20s, which was based off a book, and that became a painting. It became a, it became, it, and all of this other stuff. Um, it is based on previous source material, which is a really weird thing. Uh, people have been saying, like when I remember when there was, I hate to go back to Ghostbusters again, but when there was the whole. Um, backlash against that people were like no we're all sick of reboots and then it was like oh magnificent seven's coming out by sony as well oh that i'm looking forward to that why, why do you not have an issue with that because it's already been remade okay so a remake is okay if it's already a remake of a remake i don't get that logic you either for remakes or for some of them against some of them or you hate them i you can't flip flop when it suits you doesn't make sense dude um, so yeah, and when you have a big spectacle like Ben-Hur, maybe it's just worth not bothering, because it still holds up, the spectacle's still there, because you are still, it's not so much dated technology as it is, oh my god, they really did pull this off in the 50s, this is really a massive technological and production success, Ben-Hur is a massive huge accomplishment in, in filmmaking, um, so yeah, it has, to, it has to be relevant, it has to be worth updating in terms of the effects, as, as opposed to just um, adding a CGI glossy coat, coat of paint. Kind of like The Thing. Like The Thing was... They just put a load of CGI over The Thing. And it actually looked a lot worse than it did in the 80s. Than John Carpenter's original. Which was also a remake as well. So don't... If, if you're just going to be putting CGI over it. And it's known for its incredible practical effects. Or it's great makeup. Or it's great sets. Or it's great use of... Um, of, um, of a massive amount of extras. Just don't bother... Don't bother using CGI because then they'll just be like, well, they did it perfectly with practical effects 50, 20, 30 years ago, and you've just CGI'd over it. There's no point. It doesn't make any sense. Okay, right. Uh, next question comes from Dean Jones. As someone who really enjoyed Star Trek Beyond, it's disappointing to see it hasn't performed at the box office, considering it is the 50th anniversary of the franchise. My question is this. Do you think the future Star Trek films will be affected by Beyond's performance in terms of budget? I kind of addressed this earlier. Um, I kind of unwittingly maybe already answered your question, Dean. Um, 
yeah, Star Trek Beyond is going to make a little bit, a tiny little bit of money for Paramount. Um, but what's going to happen is that because the Star Trek films have been depreciating in box office, instead of what studios love to see is, is like a Transformers or an Iron Man, where the first film makes a lot of money, and then the sequel makes more, and then you get this upward curve, uh, where sequels make more money, or they, they peak and then they just sort of stay there. Maybe they go down a little bit, but they, they want to see an upward slant. Whereas with Star Trek, it ha the budgets have been getting higher, but the box office has been getting lower. And while Star Trek is not to the point of, um, of um, uh, being a bomb or, or losing Paramount money, they are going to have to lower the budget of future Star Trek films, which is kind of depressing because, Star because they want to go boldly where no man has gone before and see these new exotic worlds and species and all these new characters, which it costs money. Those incredible makeup effects in Star Trek Beyond, they cost a lot of money. And it's going to be depressing to... Get, you, you could do something really subversive where you have maybe a 20 to $30 million Star Trek film and just set it on the on the Enterprise. Just on the Enterprise, something goes wrong and it, then it becomes kind of like a Poseidon adventure in space. That would be a really interesting and much more cost-effective way to, um, to, to make a future Star Trek film. I don't think this is the end of the Star Trek franchise. I think that you're going to be seeing that they've got too much talent and too much momentum um, going at the moment to really stop them. I just think that they need to lower the budget, get it more to maybe 100 to $120 million at this point. Um, maybe have a bigger international appeal. And maybe introduce another, um, another Chinese star so it appeals more to international box office and... Because the domestic box office for Star Trek has been going down as well, and it's in the international box office where it's been picking up the slack. So you're going to have to appeal to a much broader broader audience, which is not a bad thing for Star Trek because you do have such a diverse cast anyway. And the whole um and the uh what the Federation is that what it's called? Um, I'm not a big Star Trek guy. Uh, the organized Starfleet. Uh, they they promote diversity and um and acceptance of all. Um, faiths, beliefs, and and races, and skin colors, and sexuality. So having adding more diversity to it to appeal to more demographics is actually something that makes a lot of sense for the for the Star Trek franchise, and it's something that I think that Paramount Pictures is going to be looking at. Um, so yeah, they're probably going to be going to China as well. So um, on the way to uh, the Poseidon Adventure, they'll probably stop off at China for a, um, for a, for a meal or something, and then that will make them a billion dollars in China, very much like Transformers: Age of Extinction did. So yeah, um, I kind of already touched on Star Trek before, Dean, but hopefully I answered your question um, wherever I answered your question early on in the podcast or maybe now. So uh, and the final question is uh, from Zachary Taylor. Uh, I'm going to ask some questions because darn it, I don't. Don't want Dean Jones to be the only one um, asking questions on here. Anyways, I have two questions. One, should the name of this series be renamed to Film Brits since there is only one Brit now? Yeah, that's kind of true. But, you know, branding, can't be bothered to, to change the logo. That's, that's annoying. Don't want to do that. And also because I'm speaking with all of you folks, even if you are American or Australian or wherever you're from, you're all Film Brits to me. Um, and Film Brit, it just, it feels like... um. A very abrupt end to the title. Film Brits kind of brings it to a much more gradual end. I don't know. That's just sort of how I view it. I think Film Brits just sounds better. But anyway. Um, and question two. Can I hear you rant on Dragon Ball Super? Because I do remember the Facebook post you've made on how um, on it. Though I am... Uh, sorry, because I do remember the Facebook posts you've made on it. Though I will say I am loving the hell out of the future Trunks arc right now. Right, um, I'm a massive Dragon Ball fan. Um, I really love the original Dragon Ball series. I love Dragon Ball Z even more. I watched it first. I, I grew up with it. I basically watched every single episode. I've played a load of the games. I am actually on my phone, actually. I'll just show you right now real quick. Um, one of my favorite games to play on my phone is uh, Dragon Ball Dokkan Battle. Um, yeah, it's Hercule. Da -da -da. Uh, by the way, I'm not being paid by Bandai. Uh, it is just a really great free-to-play game. Um, the luck-based system in terms of how you get characters and cards and stuff is just... It's its too reliant on luck, but it is still a really fun game, and they are always updating with a lot of events. But, um, yeah, big Dragon Ball fan. Really enjoying... Uh, really enjoyed Dragon Ball Z. Dragon Ball GT, I think, has some merit, but it's, it's, not, it's not a great follow-up. But Dragon Ball Super, I was really looking forward to. 
But then when it came out, uh, it, it was preceded by the Dragon Ball Z movies. It has um, there's Battle of Gods and Resurrection F, which are solid uh, movies and solid follow ups. There, um, they've got great animation, the voice acting is great, and there's a few interesting character progressions as well for Goku and Vegeta and some of the other supporting cast. And then I'm thinking, okay, when Dragon Ball Super comes along, cause it, it's just going to be TV extended versions of those movies. Of course, the action won't be as good and the animation won't be as good. But when it's like 10 times the length, it's going to have more character stuff. It's going to have more detail. It's going to have, it's going to flesh out some potential plot holes and details. And then when Dragon Ball Super comes out, it does none of those things. There's no additional character stuff. In fact, it actually takes a lot of the character stuff out of the movies. Like in, in Battle of Gods... There's a whole big thing about how Goku, this probably is going to sound completely alien to those who are not already versed in Dragon Ball, but Goku is, uh, he has a big crisis during the fight because how much he, he hates the fact that he, he is not able to achieve this god form on his own, that he, he had to rely on, the, on on his friends to achieve this form just to compete with Beerus, but he he accepted that and he did it anyway because he had to save the world, much like Vegeta had to embarrass himself at the bingo game in order to help to postpone and save the world from Beerus. He had, it, it's a movie about compromise and having to understand when to let go of your ego and to let go of your insecurities in order to um, to fight for the greater good. None of that's in Super. Um, th yeah, there is the whole bingo embarrassment thing, but they don't, they don't, they don't talk about it. They don't advance on it. There's, they get rid of interesting character stuff despite being ten times the length. And then when you have something that is ten times the length, doesn't have as good animation, doesn't have as good fight scenes, you're left with really nothing. You're left with absolutely nothing. You're just left with some pointless filler that doesn't expand on the characters at all. I'm not a fan of Goku's portrayal in Dragon Ball Super. This does not feel like a character that has had years and years of growth after the events of Z. He's too stupid and naive. Like, I think in, in, in Z, he, he had a naivete about him, but he knew when to get serious. He was not an absolute, like, pants-on-head retarded, for, back, for lack of a better term, stolen from zero punctuation. But in Dragon Ball Super, he is pants-on-head retarded. He is basically the Dragon Ball Z abridged version, but they're playing it for serious. Um... I don't like that. I don't like that version of Goku, who's just so ridiculously stupid. I, I, I get it when he was a kid. He had no formal education, but he's not grown or changed. And when it comes to Vegeta, he, his character arc ends at the end of Z. He grows. That is a fully developed character. And when you get to the Z movies, Resurrection F and Battle of Gods, when you get to Super, he's got nowhere else to go. So he's just sort of hanging around, waiting for... Like, he gets taken down first so that um, they can emphasise how big a threat the next person is so that Goku can beat him up. And then when it got to the Champa arc, because this was uh, wholly original stuff that was not done on, on the film. That was not done on film. Oh, and Resurrection F also, um, they had a whole thing about... Um, um, th about I can't, what was it? There was a there was actually some good character stuff for there about the relationship between Goku and Vegeta, but it's absolutely ab absent in Resurrection F. It's gone, and they have this whole thing with Captain Ginyu, and that they don't. Even though everybody basically unanimously hated the end of Resurrection F, when it got around to Super, they just redid the ending. But because it's longer, it was shitter. So. It, it, Instead of using the movies as sort of like um, to test the waters for what stories work and what don't work and then improving on them for the anime, they just double down, which is really frustrating to watch. And then when we got to the Champa arc and the World Tournament, and I was thinking, oh great, we could see these new species and these new characters. And we and because it's a tournament, we, could, we don't just have Goku and Vegeta. We can have Piccolo and Gohan and Majin Buu and all of these other characters who, these supporting characters who, who have had nothing to do for the previous 30, 40 episodes. And then what happens is that they get rid of Majin Buu immediately. He never fights. Piccolo gets maybe five minutes of fighting and then he throws in the towel so that Vegeta can fight. And it was at that moment I stopped watching Dragon Ball Super, where they just had a reckless disregard for their own characters. They just thought, you know what, let's just make this the Goku and Vegeta show. We don't care about the supporting cast, even though we keep them around. Like, either get rid of them or do something with them. The animation was pants, um, I, and when compared to, like, Attack on Titan or One Punch Man, and um, even, even Dragon Ball GT, Dragon Ball Z, the animation is a very notable step down. It's a, like even from stuff from the '90s for Dragon Ball Z. It is a notable step down, and I wasn't expecting it to compete with the movies. 
But from an anime 20 years ago, if the animation's not even half as good as... Why even bother? And um, I've been following Masako X. Um, he does, he's another YouTuber who um, he does reviews every week of um, Dragon Ball Super. And I, I watch those just to find out what's going on. And um, yeah, and what happened after the Champer arc was that there was, oh, there was a Vegeta doppelganger arc that lasted three or four episodes. Okay, what are they going to do next? Oh, we're doing a Goku doppelganger arc. They did the doppelganger arc two arcs in a row. They're not even trying to do anything original here. And then Future Trunks, they're just copying the Cell Saga. They're just getting Trunks from the future. It's, it's a dilapidated future, so we've got to go back. It, they're not doing anything original with these characters. It's creatively stunted. And it's really disheartening to see my the, one of my favourite franchises ever go, go in that direction. I'm going to watch the movies. I'll be there opening weekend to watch the movies if they keep on coming out. But for Super... As far as I'm concerned, it's just done nothing to appeal to me. It's just made me very frustrated. So that that is that is me ranting on Dragon Ball Super Zachary. I hope that um, that was um, the answer you were looking for. I may check out the Super Trunk, the, the Future Trunks arc if um, if it if I get the time. But like the moment I stopped watching was when Piccolo threw in the towel against Frost, um, and Vegeta stepped in because it was just. It was at that moment where I realised that Akira Toriyama and the creative team just did not care. It was at that moment I realised they did not care. That's when I stopped watching. I've not watched it since. So, uh, let's go to the lightning round. for. Um, I'm going to be taking questions on Facebook this time because um, I encourage people to uh, look at my Patreon to ask questions and then a load of them just ask questions in the comment section. And you know what? Let's just do that for the lightning round. What I'm going to do is that I'm going to dedicate a minute to every single question because this has got to be a quick lightning round and if you can just ask on here, then what's the point of the Patreon? So, get a drink. We have how many questions? One, two, three, four, five, six. We've got six questions. Time starts. We've got a minute for each. Time starts now. Graham Williamson asks, talk about what you would do, um, how you would do a Doctor Who film and what your pitch for it would be. You've got an awkward scenario with a Doctor Who film. Do you do um, the Firefly Serenity route and make it in continuity and just sever a, load, a big chunk of the potential audience and thus you slash the budget because the income, the, the return on investment is not as high? Or do you do a standalone thing? If you were to do a standalone thing, I think a movie based on the Time War, but a standalone one where it's completely separate from continuity would be a great spectacle to see on the big screen. Or maybe maybe see an alternate um, unearthly child story or an introductory story where you do have these two teachers who do find this strange box in a junkyard. I think that would be a great 90 to 100 minute um, uh, movie. Um, although you might just be redoing uh, Doctor Who and the Daleks, uh, the Peter Cushing uh, movie, which, you know what, they hold up. Those are colourful and fun. Dalek Invasion of Earth is actually a really solid film that I really enjoy. But I think a standalone film is probably the best um, you could possibly hope for for a Doctor Who movie. That was one minute. Let's reset. Time starts now. Luke, Prim uh, Luke Plimmer asks, even though it's just a dream at the moment, how would you tie X-Men and Fantastic Four into the MCU in terms of story? Um... Blimey, uh, where do I start? So, X-Men, um, you can't really tie in the X-Men unless the mutant genome that uh, cause, causes their mutation just starts all of a sudden. And then all of a sudden a bunch of mutants start appearing. Or if something maybe that the Avengers do or one of their Avengers sort of awakens them across the planet and then all of a sudden they're just a load of mutants. That could be a story in its own right. Uh, you could, uh, you could also tie that into the Fantastic Four. Maybe Reed Richards is always is a constant in the universe. They just haven't transformed yet. So the Fantastic Four are not fantastic yet. But he uses the science experiments. Then all of a sudden mutants. You could even tie in the Fantastic Four being mutants as well. But I think that would be a bit of a cop out. Um, so Fantastic Four... You just do a conventional origin story, but as for the X-Men, you may need some uh, world-shaping cataclysm type event to trigger the mutant genome. That was another minute. Blimey, I'm getting good at this. Okay, time starts now for question three. Patrick uh, Hetherington asks, Pitch the ultimate ideal live-action Pokemon film. I am still in denial about this Detective Pikachu madness. I'm with you there, Patrick. Why... Out of all the complex lore that you could have, why do Detective Pikachu? That just seems completely ridiculous. But the the ultimate live-action Pokemon film, just do the original 151. Uh, make a movie about a kid. Just follow the plot of the first games of Red, Blue, and Yellow. Uh, you don't need to emphasize so much on Pikachu, but the f 
what what's the name of that series? It, like Pokemon Origins. Just follow that because live action Pokemon Origins have the whole Team Rocket subplot. And just do that for 90 minutes. That's a solid foundation. It's a great introduction to this universe. So you can branch out if you want to. But that foundation and that license alone. Is solid enough for a Pokemon movie. You don't need to go much more complicated than that. In my opinion. That was another minute. Blimey. Okay. Question 4 from Edward Sweet. Time starts now. I'd love it if you would discuss any um, of or a combination of the following topics. We're not going to get this done in a minute. Favourite directors, guilty pleasures and VHS memories. I've been a long, long time fan of your work and I'm glad to see you back doing film Brits. Okay, favourite directors, Steven Spielberg is just the be all end all. I also love Peter Jackson, I love Sam Raimi, I love Guillermo del Toro, um, I love James Cameron pre-Titanic. Um, those are kind of my favourite directors at the moment. I also have a soft spot for Joe Carnahan. Um, so yeah, uh, those are my favourite directors, guilty pleasures, uh, School of Rock, um, yeah, uh, guilty pleasures. Um, I don't really feel guilty about liking what I like. There's not. I'm very logical about what I like, and I do try to look at things objectively as much as possible. So there's not much guilty pleasure stuff. But Pacific Rim, ten out of ten, no regrets. VHS memories. Yes, had a VHS player. I had uh, films like Flubber. I had films like Hercules. I had quite a few Disney films. The Lion King. The Lion King Two. I had on VHS. Um, that's really my. I used to record a lot of TV shows, so that was basically my VHS stuff. So that was just over a minute. But three topics. Kind of copped out on guilty pleasures. So, uh, lightning round, uh, question one, two, three, five starts now. Uh, Dominic Maxwell asks, what are the greatest moments in the Lord of the Rings trilogy? How would you rank the movies and why? Um, I remember uh, for Lord of the Rings Fellowship of the Ring, it was a couple of months after Philosopher's Stone had come out and I went to see it with my family. And Philosopher's Stone was the best movie I'd ever seen at that time. I was just in love with it and then, oh, Lord of the Rings, this is just a Harry Potter knockoff. I was young, I didn't know any better. And I, an hour and a half into the film, I'm bored senseless. I hate it. I was too young for it. I just could not get into it. I was too young. Um, I love it now, but I was too young. Um, and then all of a sudden, the uruk show up. The cave troll is there. And the, the Balrog and all the great stuff. And then it's the cliffhanger end. It's the cliffhanger ending. And I'm just like, why no? No, you can't end it there. And then I was hooked. Loved that franchise. But ranking them, uh, let's go for, yeah, probably ascending order. Uh, Fellowship of the Ring, Two Towers and Return of the King. But favourite moments, I love the Balrog scene, that is terrific. I love the Battle of Helm's Deep. And for Return of the King, uh, I've run out of time, but favourite moment of Return of the King, I love, um, is it Merry who sings the songs of the King? That's a really haunting sequence, that's really great stuff. Uh, okay, so the final question of the lightning round. Uh, the final round starts now. Callum Rourke asks... Top 10 anticipated or noteworthy films of 2017. Okay, um, I don't have a top 10 and neither do I really have the time. But I'm looking forward to, of course, Thor Ragnarok. I'm looking forward to all, all the Marvel stuff. Um, let me just look. Uh, 2017 in film. I love just looking on Wikipedia and just finding out all of the films that are coming out next year. What have we got? Triple uh, X, uh, Resident Evil, John Wick. I still need to watch the first John Wick. Uh, Lego Batman. I The trailers are amazing. Lego Batman looks amazing. Uh, the New Wolverine. Beauty and the Beast. Uh, my favourite Disney 2D animated film. One of my favourite films of all time. Really looking forward to that. Baby Driver comes out on the exact same day. That's Edgar, that's Edgar Wright's next film starring uh, Lily James and Jamie Foxx and John, John Hamm and Kevin Spacey. We're looking forward to that. Power Rangers. Interesting. Waiting for the trailer. Um, what else have we got? Uh, da, 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 Annabelle 2 looks pants. Wonder Woman. Uh, Kingsman 2. Yes, uh, Kingsman 2. The Mummy. And I've run out of time, but let me just, um, um, let me just look further down the list. War for, War, for, uh, War for the Planet of the Apes. Dunkirk, uh, the new Christopher Nolan film. Um, it. Uh, let, let me see a trailer first before I talk about It. And Friday the 13th. Um, is probably maybe coming out the same month as um, the, uh, a new Saw film and also the next Halloween. That'll be interesting to see them uh, face off against each other. And of course we've got Pitch Perfect 3, Paddington 2, and <clears throat> I'm losing my voice, Murder on the Orient Express, and Star Wars Episode 8 and Justice League. So a lot to look forward to in 2017 actually. We're really looking forward to that year. But yeah, Lego Batman is probably one of my most anticipated for that year. No shame, it looks so funny. I love the trailers for Lego Batman too. Lego, Lego Batman. I guess combined um, Lego 
the Lego Movie 2 and Lego Batman. And as you can probably tell, I'm losing my voice. It's like 2 o'clock in the morning. So thank you so much for listening to this hour-long installment of Filmbush. This is kind of the length I want it to be as well. That kind of worked out really well. Um, so yeah, let me know if you think that the lightning round minute thing is fine. It kind of makes me think on my feet because I don't read those questions beforehand. This is the f- It's the first time I read them, so I'm just got them on the fly so yeah thank you so much for listening to film Wits. if you are watching this on youtube then be sure to subscribe on itunes or leave a review because it really helps me out and if you're listening to this on itunes go on youtube and find the podcast on youtube and if you want to watch the video version there's not much more except my um comically unexpressive eyebrows um but yeah be sure to like the youtube video and be sure to subscribe for more content subscribe on itunes and youtube um, yeah, so thank you so much for listening to episode 3 of Film Brits. Be, uh, be sure to support this on Patreon, uh, www.patreon.com forward slash Trilby, where you can um, submit topics and questions and really sort of um, manipulate the podcast into whatever you want it to be. Make it very community driven. I massively appreciate your, uh, your support as well. So thank you so much for listening to Film Brits, and I shall see you folks next week.